everybody. Do you know what I think is absolutely ridiculous? It's that all over the world we're celebrating the new year by showing our most amazing moments from 2021 on social media. Yet nobody is talking about the fact that we in Israel started off the new year with two rockets being fired at us at seven o'clock in the morning. Like that makes total sense, right? Like that's normal. That's, that's just the way it is, right? Oh, wait. That's what it sounded like a couple of weeks ago on Ashley Waxman Bakshi's Instagram account. The Canadian-born Israeli influencer was speaking from her home in Herzliya about the quote-unquote accidental rocket attack that hit Israel early on New Year's Day after Hamas blamed the unplanned launch on weather conditions. Waxman Bakshi posted her message to her 300,000 followers who normally go there to see her daily makeup tips and fashion advice and how Israel's first and biggest YouTuber and lifestyle influencer spends her days with her four kids and the Israeli husband who she met and married after she made Aliyah from Toronto back in 2006. But now along with selling her line of lipstick and other products, Waxman Bakshi is selling Israel. She's joined a new project in cooperation with Israel's Foreign Affairs Department to fight the information war and BDS. Waxman Bakshi hopes that by harnessing the power of a group of wildly famous Israeli social media stars who already reach millions of people on TikTok and Instagram and other platforms, they can talk back to anti-Israel celebrities like model Bella Hadid and comedian Trevor Noah and actor Emma Watson. The word Hasbara in Hebrew basically means explaining. And it has a little bit of a connotation, almost like a, an apologetic one. Like we need to explain to the world why we even have a right to exist. I like to use the word um, like advocacy a little bit better than Hasbara. Um, or even in Hebrew, I call it like PR. And the state of Israel's PR is not doing so well. I'm Ellen Besner. And this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Tuesday, January the 25th, 2022. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. All right, so here's the Emma Watson controversy. She's a British actor. She played Hermione in the Harry Potter movies, and she's also a UN Goodwill Ambassador for Women's Rights. Right after New Year's, a post appeared on her Instagram account. She has 65 million followers. It showed support for Palestinians, and there was a quote, solidarity is a verb, over photos of a pro-Palestinian protest march. It created an online firestorm. Israeli diplomats accused her of anti-Semitism, and supporters saying the Israelis were way out of line, and there's nothing wrong with wanting human rights for Palestinians. So the issue got Waxman Bakshi's attention, And her group of Israeli influencers got busy on WhatsApp and they decided how to respond and which one of them was going to respond. And coming up, she'll be here to describe her journey from Hamilton, Ontario, to becoming a digital media warrior for Israel. But first, here's what's making news elsewhere in Canada right now. I'm Ali Kwezan Connolly in Dubai, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like. Facebook, or Meta as they call themselves now, have apologized to the Canadian human rights activist Hillel Neuer, for threatening to take his account down because he was accused of violating their community standards. Neuer is the executive director of UN Watch in Geneva, and he has a massive following, and he tries to keep the UN accountable, especially for how it focuses so much on attacking Israel. Facebook apparently didn't like a post that Neuer posted in the summer when the Taliban captured Afghanistan, and Neuer cynically wondered if Ben and Jerry's was going to boycott the Taliban too. Facebook quietly restricted who could see Neuer's post for about six months after that, but they didn't tell anyone. And when he was told his account was being closed, he fought back. There was a petition and tons of publicity. And the end of the story is Facebook Meta has now apologized and removed the restrictions. And Ashley Waxman Bakshi joins us now from Israel. Really nice to meet you. And thank you so much for uh, being here as we try to unpack a little bit of the new a role that you have, not only as an influencer in the makeup world and the lifestyle world, but also now I could say in the Hasbara department, um, if that's a fair way to describe it. Would you say that's a fair way to describe what, what they've asked you to do? Um, so, yeah. And in fact, it's it's funny because it's not that they asked me. It's that they the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs recognized that there were a bunch of influencers that on their, you know, on their own watch decided to start defending Israel online on social media and so basically all they've done is they've brought us together so we can collaborate and we can do a better job 
and they can take us around the country and teach us about history, you know, maybe things that we don't necessarily know, give us facts um, to just help us basically be an aid. Um, so we're not, it's important to say that we're not working for them. We don't work for the government. We're not getting paid to do this. This is strictly like voluntary all because it's important and we're passionate about it. You guys started doing this in a more sort of formalized way around the time when actor Emma Watson uh, came out recently, right, with a post about Palestine, uh, whether she did it herself or her people did it, we're not clear. Um, how did you uh, how did you guys decide or you're personally and then how did the group decide to respond to that? Okay, so basically, I can say that the whole going back to doing the Hasbrat happened more or less during the, the, the operation in, in May. So that's when we all kind of felt like we needed to. Specifically with Emma's post, um, not that long ago, I don't follow Emma Watson. I did not see her post. And the good thing about being part of a group of people like this is that one person sees this post, shares it in our group. We have a WhatsApp group. And we think together, okay, what, what is the proper response? And so the good thing is, is we got um, the formal points from the person in the ministry of what they would like us to respond or do or say. And basically at the beginning, we kind of just said, let's just go post on Emma Watson's post X, Y, Z. But I took it. I was the first one to be like, it's not enough to just post on like to comment on her post. What we need to do is really put this out there. Like I, I have the power because I have my 300 and what something thousand followers if I bring this up on my story or on my on my account I can send all my 300,000 followers to go and 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 post and a lot of people ask the question why even post a comment because if you're going to comment it will raise engagement the post will get more reach so it is a dilemma on social media if you should answer you shouldn't answer but at the end of the day I think that there is a large number of people who do not yet or have not yet really formed an opinion, whether they're pro-Israel, anti-Israel, free Palestine. They don't really know what to believe. And I think that if there's enough educated people in the crowd that will go through the comments and see re really well put comments that say, listen, Emma, you don't know what you're talking about. This and this and this solidarity doesn't mean blah, 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 blah. It can help to at least delay somebody forming an anti-Israel opinion in the short term. So there's always that dilemma and there is no right or wrong answer. Are the audiences that follow you mostly Jewish? So in other words, are you preaching to the converted? How do you reach the people who you just mentioned? Of course, I have also um, Muslim and Christian followers from within Israel and, and around the world, but the majority are Jewish, especially when during the previous operation in, in May 2021. Um, a lot of Israelis were looking up, were, were, were seeing all the anti-Israel propaganda online and wanted to respond and didn't know what to say. So a lot of the times just me putting things into words, especially when I do it in English, because my English is, is good and I can do that. Just putting it into English gives them the ability to be like, okay, I'm just going to copy paste what Ashley said about that. And I'm going to post this. And, and, you know, especially Israelis who have, who were born here and the younger generation who don't know what it's like to really feel anti-Semitism, who don't know what it's like to live in a Jewish community when, you know, there's a hostage situation in a synagogue. This is like, they, they can't understand how anti-Semitism even relates to the delegitimizing of Israel. Like they, they don't see that connection because they've never lived in a world where they've had to face anti-Semitism. Because I have lived in those in those two worlds, I've served in the IDF, I've done Hasbara on campus at, at Wilfrid Laurier and at York University. I can see that link where anti-Semitism and anti-Israel is the same thing. Well, you know, you mentioned York University. You were there, I know, probably during the time when uh, there was a, a lot of anti-Jewish student problems. Absolutely. Um, I was uh, at York University in the year of 2006. And... Basically, my whole passion towards Israel and the whole world of advocacy for Israel started because 
I grew up in Hamilton in a, you know, in a Jewish school, in a Jewish neighborhood. And then I moved to Thornhill where, again, I was in a Jewish neighborhood and I never really felt anti-Semitism, let's be honest, especially in Canada. But then when I went to Wilfrid Laurier, all of a sudden I was witnessing huge rallies talking about apartheid and about this wall and segregation and comparing Israel to South Africa. And so I remember just thinking like, nobody knows any facts here, nothing. And so that's how I even got involved in it in the first place when I was back living in Canada. So I did that at Laurier. And then for my final year of university, I, I moved to, to York. And at York, things were like next level, like it was violent. And I remember receiving threats. And, 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 and I think what shocked me the most is that the loudest people at these rallies were Jewish students. You talked about death threats. What is this uh, advocacy doing in terms of your own safety online in Israel and, you know, threats to you and your family? So I have obviously received lots of threats. The good thing is that these threats that are coming to me, I can see most of them are from like fake accounts or, you know, people who most likely don't live in Israel. You know, if people from Malaysia are wishing to, you know, are telling me they're going to slip my throat in my sleep and whatever, I'm not so afraid because they're accounts from Malaysia. So they don't necessarily have access to my home. What is troubling and scary, I'm not going to lie, a lot of my Arab followers started unfollowing me or telling me that they were really disappointed in me for advocating for Israel. And it's unfortunate because I think that I live in such a polarized country that it's like you're either with us or against us. And they see it that you cannot be pro-Israel but also in the same matter, like be pro equal rights for all civilians, regardless of religion in Israel. And, and unfortunately, I, I just what I said to them in response was, if you can't understand that a Jewish girl who made Aliyah to come and serve in the IDF is going to speak up and defend her country online, then you probably shouldn't be following me. Did your uh, training in uh, counterterrorism, uh, I think you have a master's degree in military counterterrorism. Right. How did that, how has that helped you for this new kind of role of, uh, of advocacy? A lot of influencers who, who have never dealt with this kind of information at all would just be so fearful of even stepping their, you know, putting their toe into that water because they're afraid of, oh, well, somebody says something and I don't know what to say. Um, so it gives me the confidence that at the end of the day, I'm a beauty influencer. And it, it's, it's funny when you look at it, like when you zoom out and you're like, this girl, like all she knows is lipstick. Why is she even talking about, you know, the history of Israel? And then I can say, I'm not only that girl with the lipstick, like I do have a, a master's in counterterrorism. I've learned this. So it gives me like the okay to speak about it as well. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Today's listener shout-out goes to Sergio Arangio. He works as a reporter for CTV News. And Sergio says he liked the interview we did about Jewish hockey and the Seattle Kraken owner from Montreal. And he didn't listen to it, he watched it on the CJN's YouTube channel, where we post all the interviews as video podcasts. And so if you want to hear more from our guests than what can fit into the small, shorter audio episode, check the videos out. And we'll end the episode today with a clip from Hillel Neuer of UN Watch in Geneva. He noted how the UN passed a resolution last week condemning Holocaust denial. Israel introduced the resolution and over 70 countries, including Canada, co-sponsored it. Only Iran objected. So that's a good thing, a resolution against Holocaust denial. Of course, unfortunately, the United Nations is a major contributor today to world anti-Semitism. In the past year, they adopted more resolutions targeting the Jewish state than on Iran, Syria, and North Korea put together. 